Multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, Wikipedia article audio. Multi-drug resistant tuberculosis is a form of tuberculosis infection caused by bacteria that are resistant to treatment with at least two of the most powerful first-line anti-TB medications, isoniazid and rifampin. Some forms of TB are also resistant to second-line medications, and are called extensively drug-resistant TB. Mechanism of Drug Resistance Extensively drug-resistant TB Prevention Dots plus Treatment Epidemiology Russian prisons Contributing factors Policy impacts Tuberculosis is caused by infection with the bacteria Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Almost one in four people in the world are infected with TB bacteria. Only when the bacteria become active do people become ill with TB. Bacteria become active as a result of anything that can reduce the person's immunity, such as HIV, advancing age, diabetes, or other immunocompromising illnesses. TB can usually be treated with a course of four standard, or first line, anti-TB drugs. However, beginning with the first antibiotic treatment for TB in 1943, some strains of the TB bacteria developed resistance to the standard drugs through genetic changes currently the majority of multi-drug resistant cases of TB are due to one strain of TB bacteria called the Beijing lineage. This process accelerates if incorrect or inadequate treatments are used, leading to the development and spread of multi-drug resistant TB. Incorrect or inadequate treatment may be due to use of the wrong medications, use of only one medication, not taking medication consistently or for the full treatment period. Treatment of MDRTB requires second-line drugs, which in general are less effective, more toxic, and much more expensive than first-line drugs. Treatment schedules for MDRTB involving fluoroquinolones and aminoglycosides can run for two years, compared to the six months of first line drug treatment, and cost over $100,000 USD. If these second line drugs are prescribed or taken incorrectly, further resistance can develop, leading to XDRTB. Resistant strains of TB are already present in the population, so MDR-TB can be directly transmitted from an infected person to an uninfected person. In this case a previously untreated person develops a new case of MDR-TB. This is known as primary MDR-TB, and is responsible for up to 75% of cases. Acquired MDR-TB develops when a person with a non-resistant strain of TB is treated inadequately, resulting in the development of antibiotic resistance in the TB bacteria infecting them. These people can in turn infect other people with MDR-TB. MDR-TB caused an estimated 480,000 new TB cases and 250,000 deaths in 2015. MDR-TB accounts for 3.3% of all new TB cases worldwide. Resistant forms of TB bacteria, either MDR-TB or rifampin-resistant TB, cause 3.9% of new TB cases and 21% of previously treated TB cases. Globally, most MDR-TB cases occur in South America, Southern Africa, India, China, and the former Soviet Union. Treatment of MDR-TB requires treatment with second-line drugs, usually four or more anti-TB drugs for a minimum of six months, and possibly extending for 18-24 months if rifampin resistance has been identified in the specific strain of TB with which the patient has been infected. Under ideal program conditions, 
MDR-TB cure rates can approach 70%. The TB bacteria has natural defenses against some drugs, and can acquire drug resistance through genetic mutations. The bacteria does not have the ability to transfer genes for resistance between organisms through plasmids. Some mechanisms of drug resistance include One example is a mutation in the RPOB gene, which encodes the beta subunit of the bacteria's RNA polymerase. In non-resistant TB, Rifampin binds the beta subunit of RNA polymerase and disrupt transcription elongation. Mutation in the RPOB gene changes the sequence of amino acids and eventual conformation of the beta subunit. In this case Rifampin can no longer bind or prevent transcription, and the bacteria is resistant. Other mutations make the bacterium resistant to other drugs. For example, there are many mutations that confer resistance to isoniazid, including in the genes COT-G, INHA, AHPC and others. Amino acid replacements in the NADH binding site of INHA apparently result in INH resistance by preventing the inhibition of mycolic acid biosynthesis, which the bacterium uses in its cell wall. Mutations in the COT-G gene make the enzyme catalase peroxidase unable to convert INH to its biologically active form. Hence, INH is ineffective and the bacteria is resistant. In some TB bacteria, the acquisition of these mutations can be explained other mutations in the DNA recombination, recognition, and repair machinery. Mutations in these genes allow the bacteria to have a higher overall mutation rate and to accumulate mutations that cause drug resistance more quickly. MDR-TB can become resistant to the major second-line TB drug groups, fluoroquinolones and injectable aminoglycoside or polypeptide drugs. When MDR-TB is resistant to at least one drug from each group, it is classified as extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis. In a study of MDR-TB patients from 2005 to 2008 in various countries, 43.7% had resistance to at least one second-line drug. About 9% of MDR-TB cases are resistant to a drug from both classes and classified as XDR-TB. In the past 10 years TB strains have emerged in Italy, Iran, India, and South Africa which are resistant to all available first and second line TB drugs, classified as totally drug resistant tuberculosis, though there is some controversy over this term. Increasing levels of resistance in TB strains threaten to complicate the current global public health approaches to TB control. New drugs are being developed to treat extensively resistant forms but major improvements in detection, diagnosis, and treatment will be needed. There are several ways that drug resistance to TB, and drug resistance in general, can be prevented. Opponents of a universal tuberculosis treatment, reasoning from misguided notions of cost-effectiveness, fail to acknowledge that MDR-TB is not a disease of poor people in distant places. The disease is infectious and airborne. Treating only one group of patients looks inexpensive in the short run, but will prove disastrous for all in the long run. Paul Farmer Community-based treatment programs such as DOTS Plus a MDRTB specialized treatment using the popular directly observed therapy short course initiative, have shown considerable success in the of the world. In these locales, these programs have proven to be a good option for proper treatment of MDRTB in poor, rural areas. A successful example has been in Lima, Peru, where the program has seen cure rates of over 80%. However, 
TB clinicians have expressed concern in the DOTS program administered in the Republic of Georgia because it is anchored in a passive case finding. This means that the system depends on patients coming to health care providers, without conducting compulsory screenings. As medical anthropologists like Aaron Cook have shown, this form of implementation does not suit all cultural structures. They urge that the DOTS protocol be constantly reformed in the context of local practices, forms of knowledge and everyday life. Aaron Cook has utilized Paul Farmer's concept of structural violence as a perspective for understanding how institutions, environment, poverty, and power reproduce, solidify, and naturalize the uneven distribution of disease and access to resources. She has also studied the effectiveness of the DOTS protocol in the widespread disease of tuberculosis in the Georgian prison system. Unlike the DOTS passive case finding utilized for the general Georgian public, the multiple-level surveillance in the prison system has proven more successful in reducing the spread of tuberculosis while increasing rates of cure. Cook critically notes that because the DOTS protocol aims to change the individual's behavior without addressing the need to change the institutional, political, and economic contexts, certain limitations arise, such as MDR tuberculosis. Paul Farmer believes that DOTS should be the cornerstone of tuberculosis control around the world. Usually, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis can be cured with long treatments of second-line drugs, but these are more expensive than first-line drugs and have more adverse effects. The treatment and prognosis of MDR-TB are much more akin to those for cancer than to those for infection. MDR-TB has a mortality rate of up to 80%, which depends on a number of factors, including The majority of patients suffering from multidrug resistant tuberculosis do not receive treatment, as they are found in underdeveloped countries or in poverty. Denial of treatment remains a difficult human rights issue, as the high cost of second-line medications often precludes those who cannot afford therapy. A study of cost-effective strategies for tuberculosis control supported three major policies. First, the treatment of smear-positive cases in DOTS programs must be the foundation of any tuberculosis control approach and should be a basic practice for all control programs. Second, there is a powerful economic case for treating smear negative and extrapulmonary cases in DOTS programs along with treating smear negative and extrapulmonary cases in DOTS programs as a new WHO Stop TB approach and the second global plan for tuberculosis control. Last, but not least, the study shows that significant scaling up of all interventions is needed in the next 10 years if the Millennium Development Goal and related goals for tuberculosis control are to be achieved. If the case detection rate can be improved, this will guarantee that people who gain access to treatment facilities are covered and that coverage is widely distributed to people who do not now have access. In general, Treatment courses are measured in months to years, MDR-TB may require surgery, and death rates remain high despite optimal treatment. However, good outcomes for patients are still possible. The treatment of MDR-TB must be undertaken by physicians experienced in the treatment of MDR-TB. Mortality and morbidity in patients treated in non-specialist centers are significantly higher to those of patients treated in specialist centers. Treatment of MDR-TB must be done on the basis of sensitivity testing, it is impossible to treat such patients without this information. When treating a patient with suspected MDR-TB, pending the result of laboratory sensitivity testing, the patient could be started on Shrez and moxifloxacin with cycloserine. 
there is evidence that previous therapy with a drug for more than a month is associated with diminished efficacy of that drug regardless of in vitro tests indicating susceptibility. Hence, a detailed knowledge of the treatment history of each patient is essential. In addition to the obvious risks, risk factors for MDRTB include HIV infection, previous incarceration, failed TB treatment, failure to respond to standard TB treatment, and relapse following standard TB treatment. A gene probe for RPOB is available in some countries. This serves as a useful marker for MDRTB, because isolated RMP resistance is rare. If the results of a gene probe are known to be positive, then it is reasonable to omit RMP and to use SHEZ and MXF and cycloserine. The reason for maintaining the patient on INH is that INH is so potent in treating TB that it is foolish to omit it until there is microbiological proof that it is ineffective. When sensitivities are known and the isolate is confirmed as resistant to both INH and RMP, five drugs should be chosen in the following order. Note, drugs placed near the top of the list are more effective and less toxic. Drugs placed near the bottom of the list are less effective or more toxic, or more difficult to obtain. In general, resistance to one drug within a class means resistance to all drugs within that class, but a notable exception is rifabutene. Rifampicin resistance does not always mean rifabutene resistance, and the laboratory should be asked to test for it. It is possible to use only one drug within each drug class. If it is difficult finding five drugs to treat then the clinician can request that high-level INH resistance be looked for. If the strain has only low-level INH resistance, then high-dose INH can be used as part of the regimen. When counting drugs, PZA and interferon count as zero, that is to say, when adding PZA to a four-drug regimen, another drug must be chosen to make five. It is not possible to use more than one injectable, because the toxic effect of these drugs is additive, if possible, the aminoglycoside should be given daily for a minimum of three months. Ciprofloxacin should not be used in the treatment of tuberculosis if other fluoroquinolones are available. There is no intermittent regimen validated for use in MDRTB, but clinical experience is that giving injectable drugs for five days a week does not seem to result in inferior results. Directly observed therapy helps to improve outcomes in MDRTB and should be considered an integral part of the treatment of MDRTB. An aminoglycoside or polypeptide antibiotic, pyrazinamide, Ethambutol, a fluoroquinolone should no longer be used, rifabutene, cycloserine, ethioamide, prothionamide or ethionamide, PA, amacrolid, e.g., clarithromycin, linzolid, high dose INH, interferon gamma, thioridazine, ampicillin, arginine, vitamin D, gerillo, V5 immuniter. Imipenem, COMOXICLOV, clefazamine, prochlorperazine, metronidazole. Predomanid, delamanid. Response to treatment must be obtained by repeated sputum cultures. Treatment for MDRTB must be given for a minimum of 18 months and cannot be stopped until the patient has been culture negative for a minimum of 9 months. It is not unusual for patients with MDRTB to be on treatment for 2 years or more. Patients with MDRTB should be isolated in negative pressure rooms, if possible. Patients with MDRTB should not be accommodated on the same ward as immunosuppressed patients. Careful monitoring of compliance with treatment is crucial to the management of MDRTB.
Some physicians will insist that these patients remain isolated until their sputum is smear negative, or even culture negative. Keeping these patients in hospital for weeks on end may be a practical or physical impossibility, and the final decision depends on the clinical judgment of the physician treating that patient. The attending physician should make full use of therapeutic drug monitoring both to monitor compliance and to avoid toxic effects. Some supplements may be useful as adjuncts in the treatment of tuberculosis, but, for the purposes of counting drugs for MDRTB, they count as zero. The drugs listed below have been used in desperation, and it is uncertain as to whether they are effective at all. They are used when it is not possible to find five drugs from the list above. On December 28, 2012, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved bedoquiline to treat multidrug resistant tuberculosis, the first new treatment in 40 years. Sertero is to be used in a combination therapy for patients who have failed standard treatment and have no other options. Sertero is an adenosine triphosphate synthase inhibitor. The following drugs are experimental compounds that are not commercially available, but may be obtained from the manufacturer as part of a clinical trial or on a compassionate basis. Their efficacy and safety are unknown. In cases of extremely resistant disease, surgery to remove infection portions of the lung is in general, the final option. The center with the largest experience in this is the National Jewish Medical and Research Center in Denver, Colorado. In 17 years of experience, they have performed 180 operations, of these, 98 were lobectomies and 82 were pneumonectomies. There is a 3.3% operative mortality with an additional 6.8% dying following the operation, 12% experienced significant morbidity. Of 91 patients who were culture positive before surgery, only 4 were culture positive after surgery. The resurgence of tuberculosis in the United States, the advent of HIV-related tuberculosis, and the development of strains of TB resistant to the first-line therapies developed in recent decades serve to reinforce the thesis that Mycobacterium tuberculosis, the causative organism, makes its own preferential option for the poor. The simple truth is that almost all tuberculosis deaths result from a lack of access to existing effective therapy. Cases of MDR tuberculosis have been reported in every country surveyed. MDR-TB most commonly develops in the course of TB treatment, and is most commonly due to doctors giving inappropriate treatment, or patients missing doses or failing to complete their treatment. Because MDR tuberculosis is an airborne pathogen, persons with active Pulmonary tuberculosis caused by a multidrug resistant strain can transmit the disease if they are alive and coughing. TB strains are often less fit and less transmissible, and outbreaks occur more readily in people with weakened immune systems. Outbreaks among non immunocompromised healthy people do occur, but are less common. As of 2013, 3.7% of new tuberculosis cases have MDRTB. Levels are much higher in those previously treated for tuberculosis, about 20%. Who estimates that there were about 0.5 million new MDRTB cases in the world in 2011? About 60% of these cases occurred in Brazil, China, India the Russian Federation and South Africa alone. In Moldova, the crumbling health system has led to the rise of MDR-TB. In 2013, the Mexico-United States border was noted to be a very hot region for drug-resistant TB, though the number of cases remained small.
It has been known for many years that INH-resistant TB is less virulent in guinea pigs, and the epidemiological evidence is that MDR strains of TB do not dominate naturally. A study in Los Angeles, California, found that only 6% of cases of MDR TB were clustered. Likewise, the appearance of high rates of MDR TB in New York City in the early 1990s was associated with the explosion of AIDS in that area. In New York City, a report issued by city health authorities states that fully 80% of all MDR TB cases could be traced back to prisons and homeless shelters. When patients have MDR TB, they require longer periods of treatment about two years of multi-drug regimen. Several of the less powerful second-line drugs, which are required to treat MDR TB, are also more toxic, with side effects such as nausea, abdominal pain, and even psychosis. The Partners in Health team had treated patients in Peru who were sick with strains that were resistant to 10 and even 12 drugs. Most such patients require adjuvant surgery for any hope of a cure. One of the so-called hotspots of drug-resistant tuberculosis is within the Russian prison system. Infectious disease researchers Nakaga and Chasen report that 10% of the 1 million prisoners within the system have active TB. One of their studies found that 75% of newly diagnosed inmates with TB are resistant to at least one drug, 40% of new cases are multi-drug resistant. In 1997, TB accounted for almost half of all Russian prison deaths, and as Bobrick ETAL point out in their public health study, the 90% reduction in TB incidence contributed to a consequential fall in the prisoner death rate in the years following 1997. Bossano ETAL articulate that concerning statistics like these are especially worrisome because spikes in TB incidence in prisons are linked to corresponding outbreaks in surrounding communities. Additionally, rising rates of incarceration, especially in Central Asian and Eastern European countries like Russia, have been correlated with higher TB rates in civilian populations. Even as the DOTS program is expanded throughout Russian prisons, researchers such as Shin Etal have noted that wide-scale interventions have not had their desired effect, especially with regard to the spread of drug-resistant strains of TB. There are several elements of the Russian prison system that enable the spread of MDR-TB and heighten its severity. Overcrowding in prisons is especially conducive to the spread of tuberculosis. An inmate in a prison hospital has three meters of personal space, and an inmate in a correctional colony has two meters. Specialized hospitals and treatment facilities within the prison system, known as TB colonies, are intended to isolate infected prisoners to prevent transmission, however, as Ruddy ETAL demonstrate, there are not enough of these colonies to sufficiently protect staff and other inmates. Additionally, many cells lack adequate ventilation, which increases likelihood of transmission. Bobrick ETAL have also noted food shortages within prisons, which deprive inmates of the nutrition necessary for healthy functioning. Comorbidity of HIV within prison populations has also been shown to worsen health outcomes. Nakaga and Chasen articulate that while HIV-infected prisoners are not more susceptible MDR-TB infection, they are more likely to progress to serious clinical illness if infected. According to Stern, HIV infection is 75 times more prevalent in Russian prison populations than in the civilian population. Therefore, prison inmates are both more likely to become infected with MDR-TB initially and to experience severe symptoms because of previous exposure to HIV. 
Shin ETAL emphasize another factor in MDRTB prevalence in Russian prisons, alcohol and substance use. Ruddy ETAL showed that risk for MDRTB is three times higher among recreational drug users than non-users. Shin ETALS study demonstrated that alcohol usage was linked to poorer outcomes in MDRTB treatment, they also noted that a majority of subjects within their study were nevertheless cured by their aggressive treatment regimen. Non-compliance with treatment plans is often cited as a contributor to MDRTB transmission and mortality. Indeed, of the 80 newly released TB infected inmates in Fry ETALS study, 73.8% did not report visiting a community dispensary for further treatment. Ruddy ETAL cite release from facilities as one of the main causes of interruption in prisoners' TB treatment, in addition to non-compliance within the prison and upon reintegration into civilian life. Fry ETALS study also listed side effects of TB treatment medications, financial worries, housing insecurities, family problems, and fear of arrest as factors that prevented some prisoners from properly adhering to TB treatment. They also note that some researchers have argued that the short-term gains TB positive prisoners receive, such as better food or work exclusion may disincentivize becoming cured. In their World Health Organization article, Gelmanova ETAL posit that non-adherence to TB treatment indirectly contributes to bacterial resistance. Although ineffective or inconsistent treatment does not create resistance strains, mutations within the high bacterial load in non-adherent prisoners can cause resistance. Nakaga and Chasen argue that inadequate TB control programs are the strongest driver of MDR-TB incidence. They note that prevalence of MDR-TB is 2.5 times higher in areas of poorly controlled TB. Russian-based therapy has been criticized by Keimerling ETAL as inadequate in properly controlling TB incidence and transmission. Bobrick ETAL note that treatment for MDRTB is equally inconsistent, the second-line drugs used to treat the prisoners lack specific treatment guidelines, infrastructure, training, or follow-up protocols for prisoners re-entering civilian life. As Ruddy ETAL note in their scholarly article, Russia's recent penal reforms will greatly reduce the number of inmates inside prison facilities and thus increase the number of ex-convicts integrated into civilian populations. Because the incidence of MDRTB is strongly predicted by past imprisonment, the health of Russian society will be greatly impacted by this change. Formerly incarcerated Russians will re-enter civilian life and remain within that sphere. As they live as civilians, they will infect others with the contagions they were exposed to in prison. Researcher Vivian Stern argues that the risk of transmission from prison populations to the general public calls for an integration of prison healthcare and national health services to better control both TB and MDRTB. While second line drugs necessary for treating MDRTB are arguably more expensive than a typical regimen of DOTS therapy, infectious disease specialist Paul Farmer posits that the outcome of leaving infected prisoners untreated could cause a massive outbreak of MDRTB in civilian populations, thereby inflicting a heavy toll on society. Additionally, as MDRTB spreads, the threat of the emergence of totally drug-resistant TB becomes increasingly apparent.